Hello, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. We are taking a break from our regularly scheduled programming for another special guest episode today. This will be the third episode in a series where I converse with classicists about either books or articles that they have published, their current research interests, or just unique classes and topics that they are teaching and exploring further. In today's special guest episode, I am joined by Dr. Amy Pistone, visiting assistant professor of classics at Notre Dame University in South Bend, Indiana. Her dissertation, titled When the Gods Speak, Oracular Communication and Concepts of Language in Sophocles, explores the misunderstanding of oracular or prophetic speech in Sophoclean tragedy and situates his plays within the intellectual context of late 5th century BC Athens. Her primary research areas include Greek tragedy in general, Greek and Roman drinking culture, early Greek philosophy and scientific thought, women in the ancient world and feminist theory, reception and reperformance of ancient theater, and pedagogy. In particular, Dr. Pistone is interested in the role that drinking, both proper and improper, plays in the ancient Greek world and uses this to reflect on the modern world. She has presented several papers, including the Discolateron Scolion, a new model of the Scolion game in antiquity, and Take a Joke, Take a Drink, Ancient Greek Drinking Culture, and has taught several classes to that effect, including drinking culture in the ancient world and intoxicating poetry. She also has an interest in ancient athletics, and when she is not molding the minds of future classicists, she referees collegiate football and basketball games. So due to the unique confluence of these two interests, I invited Dr. Pistone on to talk about ancient Greek drinking culture with a side of sports, aka how college students can relate to the ancient Greeks. And so, without further ado, here is my conversation with Dr. Amy Pistone. So I'm joined today with Amy Pistone. We are going to be talking about drinking and sports scene in ancient Greece. Thank you for joining me, Amy. Hey, thank you for having me. So the Greeks were very, they liked their wine and they liked to drink, did they not? <laughs> they did. That was a big pastime among ancient Greeks. Was it just an upper class thing or was every class into the heavy drinking, so to speak, the modern college culture? <laughs> <laughs> so people used to think that the symposium was a pretty upper class elite phenomenon and that it was really limited to the upper class. Lately, people have started to kind of rethink what that means. And just because most of the evidence we have is for elite symposia, that doesn't mean that other people weren't having drinking parties. It's just if you sort of think about the distinction between like a really high end Great Gatsby kind of party or, you know, a bunch of people drinking Natty Light in a park somewhere, um, you don't have a lot of evidence of the Natty Light type parties. Uh, and so just because a lot of this doesn't get preserved in the record, you know, people kind of didn't think that they existed or they were very numerous or popular. But people have really started to kind of rethink what our evidence actually tells us about practices and people and what was going on. And so I tend to think that a lot more people were having symposia. It's just, you know, we don't have evidence of all of the details of them in the same way that we have Plato giving us an account of what a symposium with Socrates in attendance might have been like. So what you're saying is that the lower classes probably had more of a Xenophon-esque symposium than they had a Plato <laughs> symposium. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I really love about Xenophon Symposium. I've made some friends on Twitter uh, talking about <laughs> Xenophon Symposium. But yeah, it's it feels a lot more like a real party where real stuff is going on. And I think, you know, when we start to get away from the idea that Plato is telling us the main account of what a drinking party would have been like in the ancient world, you know, we'd have a lot more evidence out there. But I think Plato has sort of dominated the conversation in a lot of ways on a lot of topics. Incidentally, like if Plato says something, we assume that that's what everybody thought. Plato must be right. <laughs> right. Plato must be right. And Plato must be speaking for everybody. And I don't think Plato speaks for everybody. How often were symposia? Were they a once a week affair? Is this a nightly thing? Or were these special occasions like once a month? You know, I don't know for sure. I'm just kind of trying to think through the introduction stuff. I'm reading Plato's Symposium right now after I just trashed Plato. I'm reading Plato's <laughs> Symposium with my students right now in an intermediate Greek class. And, you know, there it's to commemorate a victory by Agathon, so sort of a celebration. But I don't know that we have a lot of evidence for, you know, was this an every Friday night sort of thing? Most of the things that we have commemorating, you know, we have poems that mention kind of specific things, ones that maybe would have been right before going to war. There's some lyric poetry that suggests maybe people would have a symposium type gathering before going to war. 
you know, a lot of them mention specific events, but I don't think that we necessarily know how often or if you would just have kind of a normal party because it was Friday night and you wanted to get together with your friends or um, if it was more for special occasions. But I certainly don't think people were drinking heavily every night. Again, going back to Plato's Symposium, I mean, they start off by talking about half of us are terribly hungover from the night before. So maybe we should go a little easier tonight. (laughs) I mean, not just Plato, but we have other people talking about cures for hangovers and the experience of being hungover. So I want to say they don't seem to be any hardier than we were in terms of their ability to bounce back from a heavy night of drinking. That reminds me of myself in college. It's like, oh, thirsty Thursday. We need to slow down on Friday. And on that same vein, I like to think of probably was an every Saturday thing. We can call it Symposia Saturday or something like that. (laughs) Obviously, Saturday is not a Greek word. (laughs) But uh, yeah, at the Symposia for upper or lower classes, both that may or may not have happened every night. (laughs) What, What might one expect? How long did they last? What type of games would they have played? What were the point of the symposia? Obviously to drink and socialize, but I mean, like, would you go to the same symposia all the time? I guess is what I'm saying. Like bar crawls, it would be like symposia crawls. Would you be going to different people's places all the time? Or would you, you're always going to Alcibiades house because he throws the best rager or... (laughs) Well, I mean, our evidence suggests that Alcibiades spent an unfortunate amount of time roaming around the streets while he was drunk, which we can maybe come (laughs) back to that. That was sort of the end part of the evening. But yeah, so normally you would get together, have dinner, and then you would go to sort of the drinking part of the night. I mean, I think you sort of probably have your normal social group. So not necessarily everyone's going to be there or it's going to be the same exact people, but it does seem that people more or less knew the people they were getting together with. I mean, they know each other's names. They're sort of people who hung out in the same social circles. So, I mean, again, to go back to Plato, you know, I mean, it's pretty clear this is the group of people who hung out with Socrates and people know each other's names. But there would be guest lists, right? Because I know in Plato's symposium, Alcibiades and his friends were crashers. They weren't actually invited, right? Yeah. And incidentally, Aristodemus, one of the narrator figures, you know, he wasn't invited either. Socrates convinces him to go uninvited. And there's a whole bit about whether it's you should go to a party uninvited or not. But yeah, you would have guest lists, but it wasn't necessarily like Alcibiades always hosted the parties or anything like that. And so you'd move from the eating time of the night into the drinking time of the night. And it seems that was the part where if people had brought wives or girlfriends, they would either leave or it seems like potentially they would go have their own parties. We have some really cool vases that show a bunch of dudes hanging out on sort of the bottom layer of the vase. The vase is split up. So they're kind of a top display area and then a a lower down display area. And you have a bunch of dudes hanging out in the bottom part. And then there's women hanging out in the top part. So potentially, we don't know exactly what we can tell from vase paintings, which causes a lot of problems with vase paintings of symposia, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. But it seems like potentially the women would maybe go have their own parties. And we have some where there's women that are reclining on couches like the men would be, and they're playing katabas, like they're playing a drinking game on their own little top layer. So it seems like maybe the women would go off and have their own symposia. But as with so many things about women in the ancient world, we just don't have a lot of evidence for these women drinking parties. But I tend to think that they probably were having them. Aristophanes spends a lot of time making jokes about women being drunk all the time. So I have Mm -hmm. to think that comes from some sort of, you know, that women were having drinking get togethers. They didn't just do it once a month or whatever during a festival. It was something that they must have had experience doing. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, again, just using sort of modern comparisons, like I don't think you just go hang out with your friends and drink once a month and are totally okay with like having, you know, your husbands, your boyfriends (laughs) or having dudes night out and you're fine to just hang out at home and weave. (laughs) You know, I just, I have a hard time thinking that that's probably what was going on. And so I, I tend to think that, you know, the the women might have been having sort of their own ladies wine night situation going on as well. But like I said, there's a lot of gaps in our evidence. And so we have to sort of speculate and extrapolate from what we do have. Would ladies wine night take place like in the same house as the men's symposium? Or it could be at a different location. It didn't have to necessarily be in the same place the symposium was taking place. I don't think we really know. Again, the vase that I'm thinking of here, like they're on the same vase, but in terms of what that can actually tell us, usually they just talk about sort of getting rid of the women, sending the women away. And so it's unclear exactly what that would have involved. So not necessarily a multi-layer party. 
Maybe, but I don't think we necessarily want to think of it as being like, you know, the upstairs and downstairs party going on. But yeah, again, we don't really know a ton. So for these symposia, the guests would arrive. The host, did he provide all of the alcohol, all of the food, or was it expected for like guests to bring like, ooh, vintage 481 BC wine from Sicily? (laughs) (laughs) That was a really good year for Sicily. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, I, the host would really be in charge of all of this stuff. And again, you know, we have some pictures that looks like we have probably slaves who are carrying couches, like the cleane, the couch that they would recline on, like slaves that are carrying some of these around and looks like mixing the wine. And so it seems as though, you know, that would not only take place in the place where the party was going to be going on, but these are drinking vessels and vessels that you might have around. And so sort of interesting that people would want the setup for the party to be depicted on their drinking wear. Like, I wouldn't really think of it a party that you would want to have a picture of you cleaning your house before your friends came over on your cups that you're using to serve people drinks. But, you know, we have (laughs) kind of a lot of these, a handful at least, of these pictures of people bringing couches around and getting everything set up. So, you know, doing the mixing the wine and the proportions and everything. So we mentioned Xenophon and Plato have two very different accounts of the symposium. And obviously, they're Athenian. And so a lot of our sources are slanted towards Athens, as it usually is for most things. But we do know that there were symposia in other Greek polis. Do we have any idea how dissimilar or similar they might have been? I'm thinking of, obviously, there was Etruscans. The Tomb of the Diver has some wall paintings in Poseidonia, which is Pastum. And I'm trying to think of what other evidence we have. But I know we know that it especially was popular in Magna Graecia and the Etruscans. So was it very similar? Was it dissimilar? Do we even know? I don't think we know much about, I mean, we know that these were still institutions. There's definitely a connection with Sicily. We have some references to particularly Cotabas, the game going on in Sicily. That seems to have a real connection to people. We can date it back to like 6th-ish century BCE. And so it definitely was something that happened other places. But again, a lot of our to use a modern comparison again, if you were to try and figure out what our drinking culture looks like based on depictions of it in media, it's not going to necessarily be a very accurate depiction, especially if your media is primarily comedies, things like that. If you were to watch The Hangover and try and understand what an average night of going out drinking looks like, it's not going to give you a very good depiction of that. And uh, this was actually something I taught a class last semester on drinking culture in the ancient and modern world. And we spent some time looking at little clips of modern depictions of drinking and how accurate, what kind of depiction does that give you? Does that map up onto reality? And so that's kind of the big issue when we want to talk about things in the ancient world. For a long time, people kind of wanted to take a lot of things at face value that maybe shouldn't be taken at face value. When we're talking about jokes or when we're talking about artistic representations, the kinds of things that... I think sort of pinup calendars are not that people have them very much anymore, except like mechanics garages, maybe, but sort of those kinds of things that you would have around when a bunch of men are hanging out and drinking together aren't necessarily a depiction of reality either. And so, you know, the kinds of things you would want on your drinking cups, there's sometimes like really graphic sexual images. This is part of why for a long time we thought there were just a bunch of prostitutes hanging out at these parties also that Hatairai were there. That happens at modern parties too. (laughs) Yeah, that's basically every every modern party. There's a point in the night where the prostitutes come out. But yeah, so people for a long time kind of thought that this is part of where the discussion about a Hatira is a prostitute and, you know, we would look at pictures and see these really graphic images of what look like Hatira in like very sexual positions in drinking cups and think, oh, well, that must be how every party ended. And I think, you know, people recently have done a much better job. Um, Kate Topper has a great book about like, what can we actually tell from these depictions? And, you know, maybe we need to be a little more critical that just because somebody has a busty woman and a poster on their wall doesn't mean that's a depiction of reality. You know, there's a certain amount of fantasy and stuff that goes into some of these pictures. So anyway, that was a very long way of answering. Do we know anything about other symposia? But (laughs) our evidence is really hard to work with in a lot of ways. And people don't know exactly 
how seriously to take things. If someone makes a joke in a comedy, what part of that is the part that's real and what part of that is the exaggeration that's just for a joke? And, you know, I think we still aren't doing the best job of knowing exactly how to, to peel those things apart because we get a lot of sort of bad interpretations of what our evidence actually tells us. Yeah, yeah. I know that um, when I was putting together my episode, I had this like weird thought. Americans tend to have this, I don't want to say negative stereotype, but we like colleges, uh, a lot of binge drinking mm-hmm. happens that doesn't quite happen as bad in other cultures. I always was thinking, who would be the Americans of the ancient Greek world? Who would be the binge drinkers who would drink to get drunk? <laughs> and I was like, it was probably the Sybarites. And I was just like, yeah, they're probably the Americans of the ancient drinking world. <laughs> that, that seems plausible. I mean, you can't prove that it's not or it is, but so I can't ruin my thought. <laughs> exactly. I, I can't disprove it. There's, there's no possible way to disprove that. So I, I think it's basically canon now. But yeah, like the first thought that came to mind was, I mean, just like the go-to example for really bad drinkers is like the Cyclops is from the Odyssey, but then into like Seder play and like, you know, this guy who cannot hold his alcohol and Euripides, Seder play, the Cyclops, like he is wildly out of control. Which is one of your favorites. It is wonderful. It's so much fun. <laughs> but, you know, he cannot hold his wine. Like he's very quickly behaving very badly because like he can't pace himself. He's definitely clearly drunk and, you know, behaving very badly as a result. So yeah, it's kind of fun to see some like, oh, they drink too much just like us sometimes. Like (laughs) Euripides seems very aware of the symptoms of someone who is way too drunk. You get some glimpses of what is considered proper and improper drinking and not only in the literature, but also in vase painting. And I always found it fascinating. Of course, you have that uh, famous fragment by Eubolus, the comedian, that talks about (laughs) how much wine you should drink. So he says something like, uh, for sensible men, I prepare three craters and then one is for health and then the second's for love. The third is for sleep. I'm doing this off memory. I should have written this down. I remember this because I made a tweet about this. <laughs> the fourth is for bad behavior. The fifth is for shouting. The sixth is for rudeness, like insults. The seventh is for fighting. And then the eighth, which I find absolutely hilarious, is for breaking furniture. And I remember there's that famous vase image where you have people like swinging furniture around and smashing it. So how often did people get to the eighth grader? <laughs> if it weren't it to be painted about. It must have happened quite a bit. (laughs) Yeah, like if it's something that people are going to be able to recognize, like, oh, that's some eighth grader behavior. Typical. And I forget where the quote was, and I should have written it down, but I remember there was, it was from Sybaris, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember it, but they said there was a young Sybarite man that got so drunk that he thought he was in a ship that was being tossed by the storm, so he got in the furniture and was swaying around in it. I love this story so much. (laughs) <laughs> yeah somebody wrote this wonderful article about like the symposium at sea and yeah like they got so drunk that they were convinced they were on a boat and they're like throwing <laughs> the furniture overboard to try and save their poor shipwreck they probably had eight craters it's probably eight <laughs> craters exactly <laughs> no doubt they didn't just stop at eight they went to ninth which is for vomiting i remember that and then tenth is for unconsciousness and blacking out <laughs> <laughs> yeah some things never change you know <laughs> <laughs> we must say that they weren't drinking entire craters themselves that makes kill you yeah that was the craters that everybody was sharing in (laughs) i can't imagine 10 yeah the disclaimer do not try this at home yes (laughs) craters are pretty large i think if you drank one you would be pretty drunk like one by yourself yeah i mean they're big i would think one would get you in some trouble just all on its own even cut with water i think that would still not be great you don't know me (laughs) For the average person, I think one would get you in trouble. (laughs) I was always fascinated when I uh, came across that quote. I remember vaguely hearing it back in the day when I used to be an academic still. And then when I came across it for making the episode and then when I saw that quote and then I immediately thought of that image and I was like, this all makes sense now. (laughs) I was like, why is this person swinging furniture? I was thinking this makes no sense. And then I was like, yeah, he's so drunk. (laughs) It makes so much sense suddenly. (laughs) So like in addition to, you know, we have our Xenophon, we have our Plato, that we have Lucian has a symposium, the Banquet of the Lapiths, sort of the subtitle for it. And it is bonkers because, I mean, it's this total satire of 
you know, of a Plato style where you have all these different philosophers are there. And it, like, it reads just like Plato, except that like a totally overblown satire version that you have like all these different representatives of these different philosophical schools. And there's one for each type. And there's a grammarian and there's just like absolute caricatures of academics sort of. And they are having this party and like, it gets immediately out of control. Like people are, I mean, they're behaved terribly and it ends like very violently. That's why, I mean, they're, the characters are not Lapis or centaurs, you know, they're philosophers, but like, I mean, they're behaving like monsters by the end of it. And there's sort of a line in it. It's something to the effect of what happens at a symposium stays at a symposium. It's like the first rule of symposium. Do not talk about symposium. Kind of. Yeah. Well, because you have like the same framing device where like you have people talking about the party and one of the guys is like, you know, I heard about this party that you guys had and he's like, shh, shh, bro, be quiet. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you know, I, I heard that there was like bloodshed, like people were getting hurt. And there's like, wait, who told you about that? But yeah, I guess to the end that like, it's really bad form to talk about a drinking party. Like when you're not there, like it's absolutely the ancient version of like what happens in Vegas or whatever. Like you weren't invited for a reason. <laughs> yeah, this <laughs> you're not going to get invited back to the next party if you can't keep your mouth shut. And yeah, I cheated and looked up the Sicily affair. And yet you want me to publish it abroad and tell what happened when heads were turned with wine, when it all should be forgotten and the whole business put down to a god, Dionysus, I mean, who scarcely permits anyone to remain uninitiated in his rights and a stranger to his revels. And it just goes on like, don't you know how rude it is to talk about this stuff after? <laughs> and so we get these little glimpses of the less classy sort of parties where people aren't giving these elaborate, beautiful speeches and praise of love, but like the ones where people are just saying, dumb stuff and do not want anyone to mention it after the like they just wake up and cringing and hope everyone else forgot about it so a typical friday night in college saying dumb stuff heavy drinking and don't want to remember it the next day <laughs> yeah wake up check your text messages and okay i didn't say anything really stupid i didn't text that one person okay i think we're good <laughs> yeah like, minus the text messages it, it seems like maybe they had a, a pretty similar situation then too I guess in the ancient Greek version of that is they'd have to make sure that they didn't send their slave off with a message in the middle of the night. <laughs> oh, God, I could just imagine <laughs> sheepishly asking their slave, like, so did I send you with any messages to anybody? No? Okay, good, good. Did I send you with the you up message to someone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you talked about the katabos. Do you want to elaborate more on that? I would love to. It sounds like it's the forerunner of beer pong. It absolutely, I mean, I haven't done technically the legwork to see if there's a direct connection here, but. You mean the arm work? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so clever. Is that what they're paying you for? <laughs> These clever one liners? <laughs> yeah, so this is allegedly invented in Sicily. Like, I don't know if that's, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone knows for sure if it actually is invented in Sicily or it was the sort of thing we wanted to chalk up to like those crazy Sicilians or whatever. But we have references like pretty far back. There's a poem of Alcius that talks about like drops of wine flying through the air, flying from cups or something like that. And so it's pretty old, but the basic premise is you would put like either the wine lees, this, there's a whole bunch of debate about this too, but you would put something from the wine, either the lees or like a little bit of wine in your cup, in your kylix, so sort of the shallower cups that have a handle, you would kind of put your finger through the handle and then you would flick it. I don't know why I'm acting this out. This is a, an audio <laughs> medium. But you would flick it and you would try and hit something. So like there were two different versions. So to, what you're trying to hit varied, but the, the basic idea is you're putting some wine in a cup and throwing it at a target. This is where if you thought what I was a little dodgy with the evidence earlier, it's going to really go off the deep end now. So we have evidence that doesn't totally all make sense together. And most of our stuff comes from Athenaeus, who sometimes his the, what he tells us doesn't really make sense or we have like sort of conflicting information. So he's also from like the second century AD or C, whichever one you want to use, six centuries away from like the classical Athenians and Sicilians and Italians. Yeah. Like, I don't mean to throw poor Athenaeus under the bus. Like, there's a big time difference there. I tend to think, and this is based on almost nothing except my own gut instinct, but I tend to think that probably suggests that Katabas wasn't still being played in his time because there wouldn't be so much confusion about the terminology. Like, he's a little all over the place with the terminology for the parts, like pieces that went into playing Katabas. And if people were still playing it all the time, I have to think he would know 
what the words were. Like if, you know, if someone was talking about how basketball was played now, you wouldn't have people making up weird, like, you know, the round bounce thing. And, you know, people would kind of know what the words are. So I think maybe that suggests that people weren't playing Kata Boss anymore, but I might also be making that up. It could have just evolved too, because, you know, like back to beer pong, beer pong actually started with paddles and now barely anybody plays with paddles anymore. And every place you go to play, it has different rules. That is true. So it could just be that the rules that he knew of were different than rules that he's explaining. Yeah. Yeah, that is true, though. I don't think and I would have to go back and like read a little closer. I don't think he ever if I were Athenaeus describing that, I would do the like, they used to do X, but now we do Y kind of move. And he doesn't do that. Because if, if I were giving a history of beer pong, like back in the day, everybody played it with paddles. And now you usually just throw the ping pong ball that, you know, some people still play it this way or, you know, anyway, that's neither here nor there. So katabas, there were two different types of katabas. So you had katabas with a pole. And we have some awesome pictures that seem to show people like playing and setting it up on base paintings and some things that like archaeological finds that seem to be the pieces that were used for this. So it looks like you have a big pole, like a lampstand is what Athenaeus says about it. And then you have um, manes and it seems to be a some sort of a We'll get to that. He, he's not super clear on what the manes are, but you have something. And so you try and knock a disc off and it has to hit the manes on the way down and then fall into a bowl at the bottom of the stick. So you have like this big pole and then you knock something off, but you can't just, presumably the strategy is you can't just wing your wine leaves or wine drops or whatever at it because you would knock it off and it would go too far away. So you need like a very gentle toss to get the wine stuff to land on the disc, which then falls straight down, hits the manes, and then goes into the bowl at the bottom. So that was like winning this kind. That one's a little less clear, but we have this absolutely hilarious. It's just the sassiest. Again, I need to stop trying to describe visual things on an audio medium, but it's a little <laughs> Kataboss stand. And it, it's like this sassy Kataboss player with sort of like hand on the hip and holding a Kylix. And it seems to be like a Kataboss themed piece for playing Kataboss, which is kind of really adorable. And we have some vase paintings that show this stuff too. So we think like the Mane's were maybe some kind of a figurine that would go on the pole that and then the one that makes a lot more sense to everybody is sunken katabas. And it was basically like floating beer pong. You have a bunch of like little saucers that were in water. They're floating in water. And you try and hit them and trying to sink them. And it seems like you only get points if you actually are the person to sink them. So it's sort of like a battleship crossed with beer pong kind of <laughs> game. But Athenaeus says, like, whoever sank the most got the prizes. So it seems as though if you get some gunk in the saucer, but it doesn't go underwater, you don't get the points for it. Yeah, that seems to be the two different ways of playing. But then it just goes off the rails. Like, there's a plastinx is the disc that would be up at the top. And then he talks about, like, what you're throwing are... Latakes, maybe, which is either like what's left in the cup, or maybe it's the sound that it makes if you hit it. We're not sure. And then sometimes Kataboss is the name of the game, or it's the prize that's given, or it's the target that you're throwing the Latakes at. So things get incredibly shady from there on out. But we do know there was sort of this floating battleship beer pong kind of game. And that sort of looks to be the kind of classic version of Kataboss. Is this a game they would have started playing after they were good and drunk? Or is this something they got drunk along the way? Like it happened all night. I guess my question is if you have people throwing too much wine around, <laughs> are they already sloppy drunk at that point and it's just a mess? I don't think we have anyone who talks about this, which seems like an obvious thing that you would want to talk about. I think I'm just basing this entirely on my gut, but this sort of U or sort of C-shaped, which people tend to recreate, like what the clean A would look like when they're all, you know, they're kind of around the edges of the room. When they're relaxing on the couch, not relaxing, but like inclined. Mm -hmm. When they're reclining and stuff. Yeah. And I tend to think maybe, I mean, like it is the direction where you would have to have a door somewhere, but also that maybe the gap has to do with if you were going to play a game where you were throwing wine, you might not want to hit people on the other side because it seems like this could very easily get very messy messier the better yeah i guess i mean be i mean it's not like you could just throw stuff in the washing machine so and, and there was a group at the westchester university of pennsylvania 
where they did some experimental katabas and tried out like what size cups would be the best for it. And they did all kinds of tests about distance you were throwing it. And they tried out in the one with the pole and the one with the sunken katabas. But I think a pretty critical element is the effect on katabas play as people are getting drunker. <laughs> because if, as you're drinking, you're going to get significantly, that is a well-known pitfall of beer pong that as you are winning, you stay at the table and you keep drinking and you get increasingly less good at aiming and hitting targets. So I think there is more research to be done on Katabas since they were using undergraduate students. And I don't think you're allowed to serve them wine and see what happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a no-no. Yeah. So what would happen if you spilled, like if you hit the floor with your wine or if you hit somebody else? Do we know either? I mean, unless we want to think that's part of like how things ended up in fisticuffs on occasion. But yeah, I don't... I meant like, uh, were they disqualified? I would I would hope they didn't fight over it. <laughs> I don't know. If somebody threw a drink at me from across the room, I would have some strong words for them at least. Because <laughs> I mean, in theory, you shouldn't... If you're good at the game, you shouldn't be getting wine everywhere. There should be a fairly small radius of, you know, you're aiming for targets and all of the wine goes in the general vicinity of the targets. But... But let's be honest, if this was an eight crater night... Yeah. Oh, I'm positive. That, I'm positive that people were getting messy. Yeah. But there, I don't think there's like a party foul rule in the ancient symposium or not that gets preserved as far as I know. So I, I really do hope somebody hears this and gets in touch with you or me and tells me about the secret drinking game rules that I have thus far overlooked. But yeah, I don't think we have any evidence about that. So in beer pong, they have trick shots and I was terrible at them. Did they have any sort of like weird special trick shots in Katabos? Like behind the bat. <laughs> yeah, they did not have behind the So a well, Kylix is like a plate with handles on it. The ability to get a fragile, like breakable plate with handles around your back seems just very low. Hey, they had a quite a bit of scientific achievements, though. The ancient Greeks did, so... <laughs> oh my god, this is one of my very favorite. So we have this, and I don't know if there are like archaeologists who disagree with this interpretation. So it's a kylex, but it doesn't have a foot at the bottom. The bottom of it looks like a top. Like it's got like a point, but no foot. So you couldn't actually set it down anywhere. Like it wouldn't sit anywhere. It would kind of like tilt to the side. It was more like a bowl with a point at the bottom. And the wear pattern, it's basically just worn inside the handle. It looks like it's a special cup for playing Katabas, like your own special Katabas cup. Because you couldn't really drink out of it very well. It wouldn't be great for drinking. You couldn't set it down, but it would be really great for having it'd be less likely to break because you know the stem is where things break a lot and you know like people have their lucky whatever that they you know if you're playing sports or something you have like your lucky your lucky socks your lucky whatever and like I kind of persuaded by the idea that it's somebody's lucky Katabas cup and they would just bring it literally just to play Katabas. So what you're saying is they were a ringer. Kind of yeah. And like, I have no idea, like, because again, like nobody writes about it. So like, I don't know if people thought he was a douchebag for like, oh, dude, just <laughs> use the cups that are here. Are you kidding me with this? Or if people thought it was super cool. That, like, this guy again with this custom made. <laughs> yeah. Or like if people were like, that's so cool. Like he has his special cup. That's pretty baller. Like I would love to know what people thought about like. It's like the guy at the party who wears like special beer pong gloves, <laughs> like wrist guards or whatever. <laughs> have you seen that in real life? I have seen that in real life. That is amazing. I did purchase, it's like a holster looking thing that you can put it on a belt. You can hold your beer, like you can put a bottle of beer in your little like hip holster and carry it around. So you have two hands free for gesticulating wildly and you can also carry your beer around in your hip. So it's like a fanny pack for your beer. It is way cooler. I think it's made out of leather. <laughs> it is way hipper than a fanny pack. Thank you. <laughs> oh, but trick shots. Sorry, oh, yeah. I did have a thing I wanted to say about trick shots. <laughs> So you could dedicate shots to your beloved. And it is so that we have as an Athenaeus too. It's a fragment. I don't think we know. I don't mean, I don't think people have any idea where it comes from in Sophocles, but he talks about Aphrodite's blonde wine leaves echoes throughout the house, talking about like wine belonging to Aphrodite, which like properly wine should belong to Dionysus. But Athenaeus explains like this is because people like they kind of call their shot, like they dedicate their shot to somebody. And we have this amazing vase painting where there's this 
this woman who says, I throw this for you, Liagros. And it seems like she's like giving a little, little shout out to Liagros before she <laughs> shoots her shot, which is kind of fun. Because again, like I think presumably it's supposed to be like a thing you would do to honor, like a flirty kind of thing. But you can also think about parallels now where it's almost a way of talking trash to like call somebody out and like, hey, this one's for you as a part of talking trash at a game. So, you know, I have lots of like weird, fantastical thoughts about exactly what these parties, you know, <laughs> they involve a lot more trash talking when I imagine them. than I think the traditional interpretation is, but. I'm sure there was quite a bit of trash talking. I mean, even going back to Lucian, as you mentioned earlier, he does talk about Akademus and being a chief instigator of a bloody rompus, as he puts it, and then <laughs> led to, was it, he broke his face or smashed his jaw, he gouged out an eye and had several broken teeth, and he made it seem kind of like this was a common occurrence when people started drinking too much at Symposia. So if they were drinking too much and they were, as you are, when you add competition and alcohol, it tends to... Yeah, things escalate a little bit. One of the things that sort of what first got me interested in Symposium stuff in general, was working on the Scolia game, a more verbal drinking game. But like so much of the culture around all of that, I mean, especially when you have people who are all of a similar social status, you've got all these people who in a lot of different ways are sort of jockeying for social standing or for favor. And, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that's going on aside from just, you know, whatever's actually happening at the party. There's people who want to get in with somebody, you know, in a sexual way, in a political way, you know, that there's just a lot of sort of politics going on in, in these settings and, you know, the ability to sort of take a joke and to be able to like take it and dish it out is really something that is important in these settings. And we have tons of like kind of tangential references to these kinds of things in lyric poetry where people are talking about like what happens when people are drinking and what kind of behavior is going on. And there's a real focus on not being the kind of person who gets too upset or not being the kind of person that takes a joke too far. And, you know, the idea of what a gentlemanly character involves, like there's a certain amount of being able to talk trash and to be able to sort of dish it out and, and take it as well. I like to think of Scolia these drinking songs, it's kind of like a modern rap battle where you, you see jesting going on and it's one-upsmanship. It can be very political, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. The evidence that we have for drinking songs, were they very jovial in character or were, what were the themes of them, I guess I should say? Again, going to our boy Athenaeus, which is where we get most of our actual information about this. He has this kind of confusing description. So basically we have a couple different accounts of like, what is a scolion? So Athenaeus says, like, there's three types of songs that you sing at a symposium. There's the songs that all the guests sing together. There's the songs that the guests take turns singing. And then there's scolia, which are sung by the most intelligent guests in a random fashion. And the random fashion of it seems to be where the scolion meaning crooked. And so the randomness of it seems to be, but possibly other people say maybe it has to do with the difficulty, like the crookedness is sort of a way of getting at the difficulty of it. I was going to say, when I think of people drinking together and singing, it's always like, in Boston, all the drunk people swing Sweet Caroline. And in the Deep South, when, when I went to college, <laughs> it was like, Sweet Home Alabama at every single party. Everybody got drunk together and started, everybody knew the <laughs> words. I still know the words and I didn't grow up there. <laughs> it just reminds us, like, were there scully on that everybody knew that it's that time of night? It's time to do it. Get pumped <laughs> up and ramped. Let's just start singing our... It was in the rally committee at Berkeley and... It was sort of the school spirit group. And at midnight at parties, we would sing the Cal drinking song. And the fraternities had a different version that was different from the one that we sang that like the beginning was different. And so depending like what group you were a part of, you had a different opinion about exactly how the words went. There was a kind of a call and answer spot at the beginning. And like at midnight, everybody, it was time and somebody would just belt out the sort of call and answer and you knew it was go time. So in terms of like what the songs that everyone are singing together or the singing by the guests taking turns, we have some that are sort of folk-y kinds of songs, but then it, it seems like potentially kind of a wide range of lyric poetry would be available for like, you know, you could sing a bunch of different poets songs when it was, you know, we're all going around taking turns, things like that. But yeah, like there are some themes that it's a lot of... I think, well, I guess this isn't so strange for us, but sort of the carpe diem vibe of poetry feels a little darker to me in a lot of the poems and songs. There's a lot of like, we're going to be getting old and 
being old is the worst. So we better drink a lot now. And like, we're all going to die. Like there's the idea that you want to seize the day. Talk about a buzzkill. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to bother people. I mean, it's a pretty prevalent thread through a lot of lyric poetry where like, I don't necessarily want to talk about impending death when I'm out drinking with my friends, but (laughs) there's a lot of things that seem to come at that sort of carpe diem because we're all going to die and we need to be acutely aware of how we're all going to die. So we really cherish this moment. We're going to die. So let's drink those eight craters. (laughs) Pretty much. Yeah. Like there's just a lot of, you know, sort of that Greek pessimism. Like they seem to me to be sort of a bleak thread that run through a lot of poems that were potentially presumably sung at get togethers like this. But the part where it gets weird is when we try and figure out what the scolion is. So we have the ones like everybody's singing. You know, we have some that are attributed to like kind of well-known people that are these like more folksy sort of popular songs. So then we get this weird situation where apparently the scolia is super hard, but then people kind of thought for a long time, the, the sort of dominant theory was basically like you would just pass, like there was a myrtle or laurel or something, like some kind of a branch, and you would just pass it to someone and they had to pick up where you left off in the song, which isn't that different from a song that you go around the room in order, like to say that this is the most difficult kind of game because you just don't know when it's going to be your turn. It's not a super compelling argument. And you have to think creatively when you're drunk, which is very difficult. <laughs> Well, and so that's the thing, like I think, and this is part of why I got interested in these because this was my first big kid conference paper. It was the APA then, and I got one of these poems tattooed on me. I was very into scolia for, I mean, still am, but especially then. I would hope so if you have it tattooed on you. Yeah, that would be embarrassing if I changed my mind and decided I wasn't really that into it. Better than a boyfriend's name, I suppose. Yeah, that's true. At least it's in Greek. Nobody knows what it says. (laughs) I can just tell them it means anything. (laughs) So the other weird piece of evidence that we have is that we have a whole collection of a bunch of scolia, and there are these little four-line things. And it just doesn't really make sense if we're passing around a song that we would pass around a four-line song. That's, you know, you just have to remember the next line. Like, this game doesn't going to last very long. There's only four lines. And so what I think, and other people have been sort of, Garrett Collins, I took a lot of this from him, but that it is much more like that rap battle model where somebody would start with one of these little four line poems. And then from there, you know, you send it to somebody else and they have to pick up where you left off. So in, it's not super different from a rap battle where you're picking up something that they've given you. So maybe you use the same meter, maybe you use a word that's similar, maybe you, you know, they're going in one direction and you like turn it around and make it a joke about them. It was, they were trying to make a joke about somebody else and they pass it off to you and you, you know, make it a zinger back in their direction or whatever. So, I mean, that would be what would make it so difficult is that, you know, you have to think very quickly on the fly with whatever line, you know, it seems like people could use any meter, any type of poetry, but you would need to have some sort of point of contact there. So you can't just be totally out of left field, like it it does need to work. And then, you know, you send it to someone else and they need to be ready to go. So the closest modern comparison, aside from a rap battle, is like playing King's Cup, where, you know, some of the things that you do in King's Cup with questions where you ask someone a question and they have to ask a question. And, you know, there are clever ways to do that. And then there are kind of cop out ways where, you know, you have to respond with a question and you say, like, what does that mean every time it comes to you? Like, it's not a very skillful way of playing the game. Technically, you met the requirements, but it's not a skillful way of playing the game. And I think we can imagine like the Scolion game being sort of similar that, you know, like, yeah, you could come up with the first line of Homer that strikes your fancy. And, you know, whatever, like everybody knows some Homer. That's not as impressive as if you can work in like a line of Sappho, like that's a deeper cut. You get a lot more sort of credit for being able to pull some Sappho out and like weave it in to the meter and the theme and whatever else is going on. You want to think of it this way. It's kind of like poetry plus cards against humanity. So it's like (laughs) you start something and then you finish it with lines from poetry instead of dirty, dirty words. Or they could have been dirty, dirty words. I don't know that it wasn't dirty, dirty words. Like, I think this model of this game also makes sense of a lot of... So like the corpus of Theognis is kind of weird in that we get... Like some bits are repeated and like they show up somewhere and they show up somewhere else. It's just not really clear why we have what we have of Theognis. And I think potentially, you know, the reasons we have like these duplications and these different things is that the transmission of these poems came potentially through these kind of games where you're chopping and you're mixing and you're slicing them up and and working them in different ways. 
But yeah, I gave a talk last year at Kalamazoo. My last two slides were a slide from the rap battle, the TV show that's on, I don't know, Spike or something, and a slide from Cards Against Humanity. So oh. yeah, you sort of <laughs> read my mind. Those are totally the, I mean, that's the whole thing like that works with Cards Against Humanity is the ability to come up with something that works, but it's unexpected. And like that balance between like, you don't want just random stuff. Like you don't get any points for, you know, no one picks your card if it's just truly random. Like, oh, it's shocking, but it has nothing to do with the prompt you were given. Mm -hmm. And Cards Against Humanity is nowhere near as fun sober either. Oh, no. It's no. Yeah. So I'm sure these like drinking games, they probably wouldn't be as interesting had they not been drinking either. Uh, but that's just kind of my hunch. <laughs> yeah, and especially, I mean, in, I mean, it's not purely oral at this point, but in a culture that's still like a lot of things are oral, I don't think this game would be as challenging. I think you have a lot more poetry that you can remember off the top of your head than we would now. So I think, you know, it feels harder to us just because we would not be able to pull up that many different lines of poetry that quickly. But I think for sober people, this would not be as challenging as it seems to us, but i you're good and drunk, it's a lot harder to, you know, and I mean, we play games like this with song lyrics or, you know, different ones where can't buy me love, love the way you lie, you know, that you can have kind of these points of contact and, you know, you could do that with poetry. You can do it with all kinds of different stuff, but the ability to do it quickly, like everyone's looking at you and you got to do it quickly and you don't want to embarrass yourself in front of your friends. You know, I think a lot of that and, you know, that's where we start to get some references to like people who you can see their character when they're drinking. And I think going back to what you said way at the beginning, like, what's the point of this? And I think, I mean, obviously part of it's just fun to hang out and drink with your friends. And there's, you know, there's a certain sort of sociology. That, I mean, you're forming a group and you're, you know, there, I mean, there's a lot of functions of something like this, but part of it, and we see this in some of our other lyric poets, like this idea that when you're drinking, people can see how you really are. And so there's kind of a way that like, you know somebody better if you drink with them because they're not going to be as good at keeping up a pretense. And so you can sort of see who someone actually is, what their character is really like. And so if someone seems to be fine when they're sober, but when they're drunk, they get mad at every little thing. You know, they take offense every time anyone even makes a joke about them. Like maybe they're not the kind of person you thought they were. Maybe you're seeing who they really are when they've been drinking. So I think these sort of competitive games, like these agonistic games, do serve that kind of function as well, that you're sort of seeing what people are made of and you can see what they really are at their heart. And we have, there's, I think it's some of the poems by Theognis, maybe Solon, but you know, when you go to the party, don't drink so much that you can't keep yourself in control because you don't want everyone to see necessarily like what your real thoughts and fears and ambitions and things are. So this idea that there is a certain political calculation going on at these different gatherings, especially when we talk about elite gatherings where these are people who are making big decisions. And I mean, we still have the same idea now when you, you know, if you're at a party where you really don't want to embarrass yourself because there's really important people here, but you also need to, I mean, this happens at academic conferences, the ability to be witty and to be clever and to be fun while you're drinking, but not to be too junk, but also not to not drink at all when other people are drinking. Like there's kind of this fine line that I think we still have a lot of these same implicit assumptions about how, you know, there is some thing that we see a value in being able to be witty and clever and entertaining and kind and good when you're drinking, when you're, you're more likely to really be your unfiltered self. So we didn't really talk much about certain aspects of the symposia. We discussed it in my episode quite a bit, though, like the type of entertainment that you would find in Xenophon, for example, like acrobats and call girls, flute girls, that's what I meant, like flute girls, like the, <laughs> well, I mean, I guess they could be call girls. Well, so that maybe I do want to say one thing about that, you know, mention a little bit like how much women give us a problem when we're looking at evidence of the symposium, because we have just as a quick tangential point, but people have thought that it's a call girl, that it's a, a prostitute. And again, I don't think we necessarily need to think of it that way, more like, oh, it's a sexy maybe lady, but like she's playing Cotabas with what is literally like a huge mixing bowl. I mean, it is the biggest, like... A Kadabas cup is supposed to be tiny and light and something you can flip with your wrist. And it's this woman who is naked and is reclining on a... And that was the other thing about playing Kadabas. It seems as though you probably do it laying on your left elbow. All of our 
visual evidence seems to suggest that you do it while laying, like reclining and laying on your left elbow. So you have just like the logistics of it are weirder. Like, you know, if you could sit straight up, I think you can get a better, like more lift, better angle. But so we have this picture and she's laying on her side. And I mean, the cup is literally like as big as her entire upper body. So obviously that's not a depiction of real life because no one could play Kata Boss with a cup that big. But like, we can't take all of these pictures at face value is like, this is definitely a snapshot of what happened. We have lots of these pictures with, there's one that has three women and they have kind of nicknames, like Smikra is one of their names. And people have kind of read them as being like stripper names, sort of like cute nicknames that you give a prostitute and being an equivalent of that. But people are leaning away from that more now. And the flute girls would potentially in some situations be available for like hire for sex work, but also not necessarily like some are just there to play the flute. And this idea that like flute girl is a euphemism for prostitute and Hatira is a euphemism for prostitute. And every single thing a woman can be is a euphemism for prostitute. I think we're starting to move away from that on a basic level. Like there's no possible demand for that many prostitutes. But also like, you know, sometimes like you want music. It's not always a euphemism. And this is a big problem with our evidence from the symposium. So what you're saying is these images that we have, we should proceed with caution. And they're essentially, we can treat them like Instagram filters. (laughs) They may not appear in real life as they look. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that's like, you know, Instagram is not even close to real life. And I think, you know, the same deal, like a lot of the stuff, like there are goofy things on face paintings. Like just because you saw a picture of it doesn't mean it's real. (laughs) Anyway, that's all I had to say was if I didn't make sure that Hatira are not prostitutes, Rebecca Kennedy will absolutely fire me out of a cannon if I (laughs) (laughs) don't make that very clear. We kind of talked about Alcibiades like busting in junk at the end of the party, but that was in fact a part of the night. I don't think it was always part of the night, but it seems to have been like a known thing. You know, some of the stories about Socrates, I don't know if the parties don't end the way they usually end because Socrates is there and he's like, you know, this civilizing philosophical influence. And we're supposed to, you know, an ancient audience would have been like, that's such a cool departure because Socrates is there civilizing things or whatever. But the Comos is sort of drunken procession, which I think people kind of like, you know, the, the pub crawl move of getting drunk and being on the move, walk down the street, go over here. The booze cruise. <laughs> the booze cruise, exactly. But, you know, we've got loads of great base paintings of Comasts who <laughs> seem to be kind of like drunkenly dancing and like not very sturdy on their feet. So typically how I normally dance. <laughs> Exactly. And that's potentially, you know, in the context of one of these where the mutilation of the Herms takes place. But we can definitely think of Alcibiades at the end of Plato's Symposium as being part of the Comas, the sort of get drunk and wander around part of the night. He's definitely the guy that you have to call an Uber for every weekend. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) 100%. But it continues on down through like 16th, 7th century London. Like there was a group, the Damned Crew or the Cursed Crew that was known for just kind of getting drunk and roaming around and causing problems. And so, you know, there's kind of a long tradition of the pub crawl, the booze cruise, the whatever you want to call it, of getting drunk and, and heading on the move. And so that seems like it could be the end of the night. It doesn't look like it was always the end of the night, but it seems like it certainly could be something that happened at the end of the night. Before we talk about sports, is there any overall lesson that we can take from like the symposia that tells us something about the way the ancient Greeks perceived their world? Why symposia in ancient Greece as opposed to like the Persians didn't have these that we know of? Like, why did it develop in ancient Greece? I obviously don't have like the definitive answer, but when I taught this class, we started off by reading the Bacchae and you know, thinking about how the Greeks conceive of Dionysus as sort of the embodiment of, among other things, wine, but, you know, theater and transformation. And I mean, you've talked about Dionysus in the past already, Mm -hmm. but I think sort of this idea that there is a proper place and you can't get rid of what Dionysus represents, which I think in a lot of ways is a release from day-to-day 
stuff. I mean, I think, you know, it's why people at the end of a long week want to go to the bar with their friends. Having some sort of release and some sort of kind of ritualized release, I think is important. And, you know, I don't think it's a mistake or an accident that Dionysus is the god of wine and of theater, sort of this entertainment, this escape, and this way to have a space, a time and a place to be different than what you have to be all the rest of the time. It's kind of like an emotional cleansing. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, it is a very agonistic society. And also life was pretty bleak in the ancient world. Like, I mean, the Greeks were especially bleak in their outlook about it. But like any time before antibiotics, like you could die from anything. So I think in a lot of ways, kind of the Greek response to that is sort of to stare into the abyss, like to stare into the bleak of it all and figure out how to deal with that. So like they're not in denial about the fact that the world is a pretty awful place, but I think they have a place like you can't be dionysus all the time, right? I mean, the Bacchae is such a wonderfully weird play, but part of it is about having the moderation. Like there's a time and a place to do your Dionysus thing and it's at the theater festival or it's at the symposium. But if you're doing like all Dionysus turn it up to 11 all the time. That's not good either. I mean, that you have people who are driven out of their minds and violent and destructive. And so this idea that there is a time and a place for this kind of stuff, and it's important to have a time and a place is a important. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to teach this as a class that I think college students do a lot of drinking, but they don't do a lot of thinking critically about how and why and when and where we drink. And that was kind of one of the big things I wanted my students. I had like 70 odd students, a lot of whom are graduating seniors. And you know, you're coming to a point of transition and you've been presumably drinking a fair amount in your college years. And no one's probably ever asked you to think critically about why you are drinking and in what context you drink and what function that serves bigger. Like, is it about having fun? Is it about avoiding problems? Is it about forming connections with people? In modern times, it's almost kind of like a rite of passage, so to speak. And the Greeks were big on rite of passages as well. It's kind of like you have to go through this. Not everybody does. And some people go through it earlier, illegally. (laughs) (laughs) It is a rite of passage. And I think there is something, you know, I mean, when I get together with friends from undergrad, a lot of, you know, like dumb stuff we did in the vicinity of alcohol, tailgating or, you know, what have you. And I'm not saying that's the only way to fulfill this function, but I think there is something important about having some kind of a a space where you can be different from what you are expected to be all the rest of the time. Like, I think Greeks were aware of sort of that pressure, um, the expectations on men to be a certain way, you know, what those pressures are has changed, but we still have a lot of external pressures on people. And I think this having a place to be something different than that is really nice. And I I don't think it's a mistake or like, you know, I I don't think it's a coincidence that people a lot of times like have real heart to heart conversations when they've been drinking that they can't have when they're sober. They, They haven't been able to broach some topic or they haven't been able to talk about something. And, you know, they can really have a heart to heart when they've been drinking. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways, intoxication does open up a space for people to be something different than what they usually are. And so I think that's part of it in the ancient context and ritualized spaces and activities. I think Greeks were were into that. And in some ways, that is something that we don't necessarily have a lot of good ritualized spaces, but like to move into the sportsing topic, I think that's one of the big kind of roles that drinking fills is in these ritual contexts. And football tailgating is a big place where you see people having like a shared community experience. And alcohol shows up at weddings and communion. It has a lot of kind of ritual roles still. And I think this more anthropological component, the social component to it. All right. So these drinking games and these Golion games coincide well with just Greek society in general. It's very an agonistic society. And speaking of agons, the Greeks were also into sportsing, were they not? <laughs> sportsing, indeed they were. <laughs> yes. So the theme of this episode is talking about like ancient equivalent of like modern college culture. So we're going to talk about <laughs> drinking in sports because that's stereotypical of every college person, although that's obviously not true. <laughs> <laughs> the Greeks loved sports as much as they love to drink. <laughs> Maybe. That seems close to, yeah. So not only did the ancient Greeks love to drink, um, but they really love their sports. And as you mentioned, modern culture likes to tailgate. Did the Greeks also, before the Olympics or 
any of their Panathenaic festivals or any of their religious festivals. Do we have evidence of tailgating taking place? What we would call tailgating, obviously, it's a modern word. <laughs> but the Greeks shotgunning a beer on the, the fields of Olympus? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, think we do, but we definitely have. I mean, there's a lot of points of contact there. So, you know, we have a lot of crotters and other things that have like, you know, that, that seem to be given as prizes. They have like very athletic prowessy sort of things on them. You know, we have some ritons that have like sport type stuff on them. So there's definitely a lot of overlap, but I don't think like tailgating as, as we think of it, though, you know, being usually involved in some sort of bigger festival, like religious context, you know, there would be the eating and drinking part of the festivals. But I don't think we have like a proper tailgate with brats and beer and all that. But yeah, I think in a lot of ways, you know, sort of the general approach to sports being, you know, it's the place you get to earn glory when you can't go to war, like you can't earn glory on the battlefield. And so sports become a stand in or a proxy or a even training for, you know, to keep people fit and ready to go for when they are needed in war. And so I think it's sort of this, you know, sports being a way that you can earn chaos is a big theme through there. And so I think, you know, a lot of that agonistic, that kind of jockeying for prestige and for honor that we see in the symposium, like I think a lot of the same mindset undergirds sporting events where, you know, there's a big sense of civic pride and, you know, identity is really tied up in a lot of ways. Like it's a big deal for a polis to have a guy who won boxing or whatever, you know, I mean, people would get rewarded by the polis and things. And so, you know, that being a big deal and something that sort of vicariously, and this, I mean, this is one of the reasons that I'm so interested in sports in the ancient world is because, I think sports in the modern world serve as like our best proxy for that sort of civic pride. Like I'm from Northern California. I don't have any particular regional, you know, my town is small. I don't brag about it to people other places because they don't know what it is. But sports fandom has really taken the place of a lot of that sort of civic pride that when we think about what does it mean to be a Spartan or a Corinthian or an Athenian in the ancient world, and there's so much more identity tied up there than we have with you know, we're much more mobile, like our city isn't our whole identity. But I think sports is the one place where we actually do see that kind of identity. Like, well, it's still kind of like that, especially in like the Northeast, and like some of the Eastern Coast cities, like Boston and New York and Philly. They're very parochial. When you think of like, what does it mean to be from Boston? Like, what are the first things that come to mind? The Red Sox? Yeah. Like, (laughs) and even if you don't live in Boston anymore, like that's a part of your identity that you take with you wherever you go. Like I'm a Red Sox fan because my father was a Red Sox fan and his father was a Red Sox. And I mean, you can see this all the time with Steelers fans, right? Like there's Steelers bars everywhere. That is something you pass down to your children and your grandchildren and you set up a branch community and wherever you happen to live now that I think, you know, a lot of that identity you know, what, what you identify as being a part of that city comes with you when you go somewhere else. And it a lot of times takes the form of your sports team, like who you root for. And so, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons that I've gotten particularly interested in thinking about sports in a more like academic way, because I think that that serves a big function that we don't have anything else that does in quite the same way in modern society. It really goes to show with not just the drinking and the way that ancient drinking games and the banter is kind of similar to what it is in the modern world, but the same way, like the way they view sports. There's a lot of things about ancient Greece that are very foreign, like foreign as an odd and weird to like the modern senses, but there's a lot of continuity or at least flex of continuity. You can see just like so much has changed, but at the same time, so little has changed. People are people and people are connected relatively in the same things throughout history. Now we're connected by technology. It's quite different. <laughs> Well, and, you know, and I think, I mean, obviously it's not exactly the same thing, but, you know, when we think about sports now, there is sort of a, you know, like the really major sporting places, like people want to make a pilgrimage to a handful of places like those, you know, to see a game at Wrigley Field or to go to a game at the big house or whatever, like there is something still sort of sacred about the space and, you know, the experience of coming together as a community. And there was a recent article somebody wrote about like how CrossFit and SoulCycle are kind of taking the place of religion and, you know, this kind of need for a communal place. But this idea that sports do still serve a really important function. And we think about like, oh, 
it's not a religious, like it's not a church, but like, you know, in a lot of ways it, it is doing a lot of the similar work of kind of bringing people together and, and forming a sense of community and identity. So that being said, the ways that modern conceptions about ancient sports just fascinate me because like, you know, we think about the modern Olympics, like that's just like ancient Greece had the Olympics and like, it's so different. The whole premise of it. I mean, it's still like the idea of amateurism as, you know, like this dates back to the ancient Greeks and gentlemen having this pure noble form of sporting. And like, that's not what it was like. And, you know, that it comes through to like the modern Olympics and the NCAA that, you know, this pure form of sport that has nothing to do with money that cheapens it and dirties it up. And like, none of that is what the Greeks would have, you know, like that, that would have been a, a weird idea to ancient Greeks. Maybe in like the eighth century, <laughs> like when the Olympics are first kicking off. But by the time you get to the classical period, you have people cheating for money and like you have city states cheating. Yeah, people are throwing matches. If they had dope, they would do what the Russians would be doing. I'm positive. Like you, you don't think to get a leg up on, I mean, all the stuff that people are trying to do to, to win. I am positive if they had the technology to be doping, somebody would be trying to be doping. You know how like in the modern world, we kind of think of like athletes are dumb jocks. Was there kind of an ancient perception of like that? Or is that just a modern stereotype? Because I know like Plato says something. He said lots of things. I mean, I think this idea that there's this distinction between like you're either a body or you're a mind kind of person. I blame a lot of things on Plato. It's a good natured blaming. I don't want anyone to write me angry tweets talking about how I'm anti-Plato. But this idea that the life of the mind is different and sort of transcends the life of the body, this mind-body dualism, I think in some ways that gives rise to this kind of preferencing the mind over the body. But like if you think about Achilles or Odysseus, like they're smart and super athletic. You know, I think for so much, I mean, I wouldn't say like there's this break at Plato and it never comes back. But, you know, the idea that athletics and academic stuff should go hand in hand is a pretty strong thread through a lot of yeah, that was the core of their education. It was like sound mind, sound body. They would learn their grammar, basically recitation of Homer <laughs> when they were young. <laughs> they would learn to read and write, and they would learn sometimes mathematics. And then they would also be taught at the gymnasia, or gymnasia, if you will. So <laughs> it kind of went hand in hand as like athletics, like the perfect person was athletic and smart. But over time, that seems to have changed quite a bit. There's like a negative stereotype. The philosophers valued athletics, but there's a few more than just Plato were anti like those who competed at the events. I think it was Xenophanes who said something about an Olympic victor, how empty his head was or something. Xenophanes said something. I can't remember what he said exactly, but I remember he said something because I had it in my podcast. And, you know, that was like two years ago, though, when I covered it. <laughs> Most people cannot be good at both. So it makes sense that you want the things that you're good at to be the most important things, right? And the fact that most of what gets preserved to us is the stuff that the brainier people were doing. You know, we don't get a lot of writings of the jocks when they were not training for the Olympics or whatever. Like one of the most famous ancient athletes was Milo, and he was a pupil of Pythagoras, supposedly. So yeah. it's, it's kind of interesting, that dichotomy. I would love to, like, if we'd gotten some, you know, dialogues or like philosophical writings by somebody who was very much into the athletic side of things, because clearly Greeks are into athletic stuff. You know, I mean, the idealized male form, like they're all about that and sculpture. And when we think about like in mythological exempla, like there's tons of, you know, you want to be a speaker of words and a doer of deeds and like all of these kind of things that you should aspire to. So yeah, I don't know exactly when that that big distinction comes in that you're either a jock or a nerd, but I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that shouldn't be the case. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, you should have both, you know, the sound body and sound mind. You know, there are a lot of these places where we, we think about our heroes as being kind of both and look at Greek tragedy, like everybody talks like a super highly trained sophist and they are also like war heroes and things. So like clearly these things do coexist in a lot of places. But yeah, at some point there seems to be a big break between jocks and nerds. 
I'm curious if it had to do with the Romans and their distaste for athletics. They were lower levels of society and slaves were gladiators. Yeah, that seems very plausible where, yeah, it becomes more about entertainment and not about a higher pursuit. Yeah. And sort of the individual athletic prowess as being, you know, I mean, we get like Pindar's is likening people to all kinds of major mythological exempla. And there's like this real elevation to sort of godlike status in the Greek world. Yeah, I wonder if it is kind of the when stuff gets filtered through the Romans that we start to see this because they're slaves that are entertaining the higher class people, you know, it becomes less about the sport per se, and more about the entertainment value of it. That begs the question or brings it full circle. What distinguishes sport from entertainment? I guess it's different for the Greeks and it's different for the Romans. The lines are pretty blurred in the modern world, but the most important thing being the individual prowess of the athletes and as opposed to how much fun it is to watch. I would say to some extent, we see this with like the big money sports, you know, your football, basketball, whatever. Like we want to see a good game. Like we want something that's going to be exciting. We don't want to see one team trounce the other, even if like it's, it's such an impressive show of physical ability and things like that. If you're a disinterested viewer of a game, like you want a good game. Yeah, as opposed to if we think about individual sports, like track and field or something. I mean, there it really comes down to we want to see a person do the very best that the human body is capable of doing. You know, we want to see Usain Bolt break the world record. Like, what is the best thing the human body can accomplish as opposed to like, we want to see like a good and exciting event. And, you know, I don't root for any particular NFL team. So like, I want the Super Bowl to be close and exciting, ideally like high scoring and real like back and forth. And I mean, if we think about modern examples too, like it's entertaining when cars spin out or catch fire or a hockey fight, you know, there's spectacle that it's not about what's good. Like butt fumble stuff was hilarious. It is hilarious every time I watch a gif of the butt fumble. Like it's entertaining, but it's not an impressive show of athleticism. I don't know. Like I I can't think of any examples that we have of ancient Greek people being like, wasn't that hilarious when somebody like wiped out hard and... The Hippodrome, the horse races, didn't they love when crashes happened? Because I remember Pintar talks about a chariot. There was one sole finisher of 41 total competitors and the crowd went wild. They were basically demolition derbies and the Greeks really liked them, just like the Romans did, because they were dangerous, deadly, and total catastrophic. (laughs) But, you know, because it seems like for the most part, at least what we have preserved is much more about like the glory and the chaos and the accomplishment and how great it is that people can do these things, which to my mind is very different. Yeah. But at the same time, these horses that we're doing in the Hippodrome and the jockeys, they weren't actually like, I mean, they were Greeks, but they weren't like, yeah, they're not really competing per se. Like the owner is sort of the one. Yeah. And the jockeys aren't, they're usually like lower class citizens. Yeah. I wonder if that has to do with it that, You know, the owner of the horse is the one who like gets all the chaos for that or the person who entered the chariots gets all the chaos for that. But yeah, I mean, that seems like one of the big differences between kind of sport and entertainment that, you know, is it about the enjoyment of the spectator period full stop? Or is it about, you know, the spectator is going to enjoy how great the athletes are doing? Or, you know, there are plenty of sports that I only want to watch if something ridiculous happens that, you know, I I have no interest in spectating as a sport. But if something silly happens, I'm I am there to watch it. I wish we had some accounts of like drunken spectators or spectators fighting in the stands. I wonder if we do. And, you know, a lot of those, I feel like the problem, and I guess this sort of ties into both parts here, but I think because of like you were talking about the divide between like sports and intellectual activity, but I think for a long time, people kind of didn't think about sports as being as worthwhile a topic of like intellectual consideration, like in the same way that like, well, drinking is also not like a serious topic. Like you don't do serious scholarship about sports and drinking that they're sort of seen as kind of lower forms of entertainment, lower forms of culture. And so, you know, I think in in a lot of ways, like it's only relatively recently in the history of classics that people have thought a little bit more deeply about like, no, these are important institutions. Like these meant a lot to ancient Greeks and we have a lot to gain from thinking about these things juxtaposed with our own cultures. So, you know, I think that is a nice shift, but it feels fairly recent to me that people have like actually considered this a, a worthwhile topic of study. I mean, other than just like the Olympics. 
Yeah. Which again, like how different the use of the ancient Olympics was very motivated with an agenda for what we wanted the modern Olympics to look like. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, men of leisure who had the means to support themselves and, you know, the way that amateurism, among other things, has been sort of wielded against people that you didn't want to have a chance to compete. Like Jim Thorpe comes to mind right away of, you know, the way that like, oh, no, you broke the rule about amateurism. Like, well, you know, it means that you only have a pretty narrow pool of people who can compete if you do not let people take any money whatsoever for sporting. And so, you know, I think kind of the reception of the ancient Olympics into the modern Olympics is just a whole mess of complicated things in terms of like people had a real agenda, some real motivation for exactly what picture of the ancient world they wanted to project with the Olympics. So as an aside, I'm actually from the town that Jim Thorpe's from, where they had the Carlisle Indian School. What? That is super cool. I had no idea. That is so cool. (laughs) You should have led with that. Not like I have a podcast, something, something like. One of the football teams that I coached were the Carlisle Indians because the Carlisle Indian School. Right. Yeah. And then we played our games on the War College on their football field because they sponsored them. The War College barracks is on top of where the Indian School used to be. That's really cool. Yeah. Did you play Pop Warner football? Because Pop Warner coached there, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The basketball court there is called Jim Thorpe Court, I believe, or Arena. Ah. Yeah. Something like that. It's pretty cool. That is super nifty. He played like every sport. He was good at it too. Yeah, he really did. I don't know if he would be quote unquote good in modern times, like at every sport. Yeah. I mean, the level of athleticism from like even just 30 years ago. Thank you for joining me. Cheers to you. It's like a drinking (laughs) tie-in. Oh, yes. If people want to learn more about what you have to say, where can they find you at? You can mostly find me on Twitter making dumb jokes, and they're mostly classical related dumb jokes at A Pistone. And other than that, I teach at Notre Dame. And if anyone has any questions, comments, thoughts, I would love to hear from people. I guess technically I'm on Instagram too, but it's mostly pictures of running. So I don't know if anyone wants to see any of that. But A Pistone at nd.edu. And yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you for joining me. Mm-hmm.